We are back. Welcome back. I certainly have missed you all. Hopefully the feeling is mutual. I'm so thankful and happy that you all have decided to join us and tune in once again for another episode of Change of Raymond. We have a lot to cover, so no housekeeping today. We're going to get right into the study. If this is your first time joining us, we welcome you and we invite you to become a part of our Save to Serve Change of Raymond family. So welcome one, welcome all. Hopefully you have your Bibles, you have your papers, you have your pencils, and hopefully we have ears to hear what the Lord will say to us regarding change of raiment. So for the past two weeks, we have been dealing with modesty from the perspective of covering one's nakedness. We have been dealing with revealing clothing, but modesty is a broad word, and modesty encompasses more than just covering one's nakedness, more than just... Um, revealing the body. It also deals with being simple in our dress. It deals with being unpretentious in our dress. It deals with being un, unassuming in our dress. And not just in our dress, but in our characters as well, as we have been learning that, that the dress often reflects what the character is, what is in the heart. So that is what we are going to be dealing with. So many of you see the title there before you. We are going to be dealing with the subject, Look at Me, peacock spirit verse versus the meek and quiet spirit, right? We're talking about holy garments for holy people. So we have been establishing week after week that what, whether you eat, whether you drink or whatsoever you do, do all to whose glory? The glory of self? No. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all to the glory of God. So our dressing should be to the glory of God. We have also been looking at this the principles of dress reform through the sanctuary. And it is just so beautiful. And I've been enjoying studying the um, dress reform through the lenses of the sanctuary. So we're going to uh, continue on that train and we're going to go a little deeper. All right. So, of course, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a what? A holy nation, a peculiar people. Right. It also says that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see here that we are called a holy nation and we're also called a royal priesthood. And in the context of dressing, God has called us out of the darkness of worldly fashion, right? Out of the darkness of idolatry of dress into his marvelous light of dress reform. I'm so thankful that the Lord has opened my eyes to the principles of dress reform because it has been a tremendous blessing for me. Studying it and practicing it, it has just had so many innumerable, innumerable blessings that attends um, practicing dress reform. And why? Why has God called us out of the darkness of worldly fashion? So that we can show forth, so that we can be an example of how Christians should dress. When people look at us, they should see Christ in us. They should see that we are followers of Jesus Christ. So we want to go to the screen here as we continue looking at the dress as it relates to the sanctuary. So it says, in the tabernacle service, God specified every detail concerning the garments of those who ministered before him. Thus we are taught that he has a preference in regard to the dress of those who serve him. Now, do we claim to serve God? Yes, we do. So this applies to us, right? He has a preference. Very specific were the directions given in regard to Aaron's robes, for his dress was what? His dress was symbolic. So the dress of Christ's followers, here's the comparison, should be symbolic in all things. We are to be representatives of him. So in our dress, we are not representing ourselves. We're not representing these name brands. A lot of people walk around with these name brands on their clothes as though they're trying to show off. Oh, I have Gucci, I have Louis Vuitton, as though we're being paid or endorsed by these companies. We are representatives of the God of heaven. Let's continue. It says here, our appearance in every respect should be characterized by what three things? Neatness, modesty, and purity. So where can we find these specifications of Aaron's dress, how the priests were to dress in the sanctuary? We can find it, and I mentioned this last week, so hopefully you all took your notes. So put in the chat where we can find 
how God told the priest to dress. Hopefully you all have it right. It's Exodus chapter 28. I want to read for you two specific verses. These are going to be very important as we move forward in our study. Verse 2 says here, And thou shalt make holy garments. What kind of garments? Holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. So there's three things I want to highlight here. That Aaron's garments were to be what kind of garments? And of course, Aaron was the high priest. He represents Jesus, right? Because Jesus is our high priest. He's also our lamb, but he also became high priest. So it said that he was to have holy garments. Is Jesus holy? Yes, everything about God is holy. So Aaron had to be holy in character and his dress had to reflect that holiness. So it said that his garments were to be holy. So when we put on garments, we should be wearing holy garments, the garments that God has chosen for us to wear. And it says that these garments should be for two things, for glory or for beauty. We talked about 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that whatsoever we do, all should be done to whose glory? The glory of God. So when it says that these garments were to be for glory, it wasn't for the glory of the priest himself. No, it was to turn the attention of everyone that saw the priest to God, to see his glory. And what does glory represent in scripture? God's character. So when people look at our dress, can they tell that we're Christians? Can they tell that we're servants of the most high God? Do they see the character? Do they see the holiness of God? Or do they see someone that's trying to bring glory to him or herself? What do they see when they look at your dress? Do they see someone that's trying to get attention? Look at me, look at me. Look how bright and dazzling and beautiful I am. Or does our dress point to the creator? And it should also be for beauty. Everything regarding the sanctuary was done so intricately. Everything was, was laid out so beautifully. And so that's another principle. Our dress should be beautiful, and we are going to get into that. All right? So now let me ask you this question. So that's the high priest. And of course, we found out from 1 Peter 2, verse 9, that we are a royal priesthood. But was it only the priests that were to be arrayed in holy garments? What about the congregation? What about the rest of the people? Did God specify how his people, Israel, were to dress? Did he? Absolutely, he did. And we can find that in Numbers 15. And the specific verses, if you read from verse 37 all the way to verse 40. So I'm just going to read 38 and 39. There's some points here that we need to uh, pull out of this scripture. It says, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of what color? A ribbon of blue. Why blue? Verse 39 will tell us. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and do what? Remember. Remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye use to go a whoring. So they had this garment of blue so that they could do what? They could remember they could remember the commandments of God. So our dress should remind us that we are commandment keeping people. Our dress should not only be a reminder to us, but also to those that look upon us of the, re of the commandments of God. People should be able to know that we are Christians by our dress. People should be able to know that we are Sabbath keepers because what is the fourth commandment say? Which commandment in the Decalogue, I just gave it away, says, remember, it's the Sabbath commandment. So our dress should testify to the fact that we are not only Christians, but that we are seventh day Sabbath keeping Christians. And to confirm that, I would like us to look at this statement here. And it's from testimonies, uh, testimonies from the church, number 12 and page 30, 38. I was referred to numbers 15, 38 through 41. We just read that. And it says, here God expressly commanded a very simple arrangement of dress for the children of Israel. Why? For the purpose of distinguishing them from the idolatrous nations around them. So let's pause there. Should we be blending in with the people of the world? Should we be dressing immodestly and according to the worldly fashions of those around us? 
No, we shouldn't. Our dress should distinguish. Remember we read we are a peculiar people, a holy nation? We should be distinguished by our dressing. People should be able to look at us and tell that there's something different. All right, let's move on. It says here, as they looked upon their singularity of dress from the world, they were to remember, there's that word again, remember that they were God's commandment keeping people. Have you forgotten that you're God's commandment keeping people and that he had wrought in a miraculous manner to bring them from Egyptian bondage to serve him, to be a holy people unto God, not to serve their own desires or observe and do according to the idolatrous nations around them, but to remain a distinct separate people. Now that applies to us as Seventh-day Adventists. I'm reminded of several places throughout the spirit of prophecy where Sister White says that God has cut his people out, Seventh-day Adventists, by the mighty cleaver of truth. He cut them out, the mighty cleaver of truth, the first, second, and third angel's message. He has separated us from the churches of Babylon, and he's drawn us into a sacred nearness to himself. So since that is the case, since we, are to be, we have been separated, cut out from these other churches, cut out from the world, why should we look just like them? Why should we act just like them? Why should we dress just like them? We should be dressing separately. We should be dressing, our dress should be distinguishable from those. But many of us, sadly, unfortunately, are just like Achan. We are hoarding, grabbing, and hoarding the Babylonian garment, the Babylonish garment. We're calling it a goodly garment and saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with this type of dress. Oh, this is, God doesn't expect us to be old fashioned. God, you know, he doesn't really care. It's, it's all about the heart. He doesn't care what I put on my body. And we're doing like Achan when we should be a distinct and separate people. So now that we've laid the foundation, and you can read the rest of that statement there, I want us to look at two familiar scriptures, and we're going to delve into simplicity of dress at this time. All right, the first one we're going to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 2, all right, and verse, verses 9 and 10. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 9 and 10, very familiar scriptures. You probably all know them. It says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in what kind of apparel? Modest apparel, with shamefacedness, that means with humility, and sobriety, not with broided hair. We're going to deal with the hair, or gold, or pearls. We're going to deal with jewelry, not in this study, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. All right, so we see here the principle that we are to be dressing humbly, simply, modestly. That's a part of modesty. It's not just about covering one's nakedness. It's also about, also about dressing simply, okay? Let's go now to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start out in verse 3. Whose adorning, let it not be, that outward adorning of what? Plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of what? A meek and quiet spirit. So our dress reflects what kind of spirit we have. So this is contrasting now those that put on all of these external things, these extravagant garments, these uh, exorbitant, expensive garments, gaudy, showy, flamboyant, you, you name it, ostentatious, all of these extra uh, trimmings and, and fandangles and bling bling, whatever you want to call them, all of these extra things that they're putting on to draw attention to themselves. And I have found, which is often the case, and the Bible is going to confirm it, that the individuals that are wearing these loud and showy flamboyant clothing, it reflects their personality. A lot of time they're very boisterous, very loud, very attention seeking, and they want to draw all the attention, attention to themselves. If you go to the book of Proverbs chapter seven and verses 10 and 11, it talks about this woman. She was arrayed in the attire of a harlot. And verse 11 says that she was loud and she was stubborn. So her personality accompanied that ostentatious dress, that superfluous dress that she had on, the garments that she had on. So a lot of times, again, I'm just reiterating, when we put on that to draw attention to ourselves, not attention to God, we 
also are showing that that's the kind of spirit that's in our heart. We are displaying pride of dress. And the word of God tells us from Genesis and Revelation that we are to flee from pride. We are not to be proud. When you think about Lucifer, his heart was lifted up. Why? Because of pride. How was he arrayed? Did he have on ornaments? He did. That's another study. So we won't go there. So we are going to go to a visual and we are going to show you an example of this showy, gaudy, ostentatious, exorbitant type of dressing that unfortunately many Christians have succumbed to. And many of us are, are dressing that way, some of us ignorantly and some of us because we still have pride of dress in our hearts. And even though we may, like I said, we may be covering our body, we may be wearing things that don't, that are not revealing as far as uh, revealing our skin and our bodies and such the like, or things that are tight, but we might be wearing things that are very showy, that are very, that are um, designed to draw attention, the glitters, the sparkles, the, the loud showy colors, you know, the big and the bold, just the, even the shape of some of the clothing now. And Christians, unfortunately, are, are doing these things, and that's, <laughs> that shouldn't be. You know, and when you think about it also, we read the scripture from 1 Timothy and also 1 Peter, 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Peter 3, that we are not to put on our persons gold, pearls, costly array, uh, gold and pearls. So now what many Christians are doing now, they're putting the pearls and the gold and all of these things, they're putting them on their clothing. They're putting jewelry on their clothing for the same purpose, to attract attention, thinking that it makes them more beautiful. So we're going to go to the visuals here and show you exactly what we're referring to. So here we have a lady <laughs> dressed up very uh, immodestly. She's not dressed simply. And I'm not sure if you all can see, but in the center of this garment, she has pearls. She has little gold um, sparkles, beaded sparkles and all kind of um, things that design to dazzle, bedazzle, all of these jewels. These are things that we are warned against in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. This is very showy. If you look at the hat, just imagine if someone comes to church like this, comes to save to serve, and you sit behind a person like this. And oh, this isn't the worst type of hat. There's hats that get even more showy and flashy than even this hat here. Big hats. With all kinds, I've seen hats with feathers coming out of them, like the peacock. We're going to talk about the peacock later on. And all of this is designed to draw attention to oneself. We should be drawing attention to God. Our garments should be to draw attention to the Lord, not to self. Okay, so this is an example of something we shouldn't wear. And it's also immodest as it has a loose, uh, swoopy neckline. Okay, uh, let's look at the gentleman here. You see him, he's wearing, what, what is this called? This is called a zoot suit, if any of you have ever heard that term. You know, the only thing we need, you can't see his feet here, but we need some alligator shoes or some type of flashy snakeskin shoes that people wear. But this is all designed to draw attention to self, not attention to the Lord. Wearing bright orange. And just imagine what's sad is sometimes you even have ministers wearing things like this. And then they put on um, expensive Cufflings, cufflings that can be ranging close to $1,000, putting in all kind of accessories and um, just extra stuff that is totally unnecessary. What is the point? Are we trying to draw attention to self or are we trying to draw attention to the Lord? What is, your, what is our motive in putting on these kind of garments? If God tells us not to put these jewels on our person, why are we putting jewels? And this is just one example. There, there are plenty of examples. So we have to now go in self-examination and ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what is my motive in purchasing um, certain articles of clothing? What is my motive in wearing certain pieces of attire? Why did I buy this orange suit? I want people to look at me, right? We should want people to look at God. When they see us, we should want them to see a reflection of God because we were made in his image. Not to say, oh, this person must be wealthy. Look at this expensive hat. Look at this expensive dress. Ooh, this guy is very fashionable. Look at his, um, he has a good style. He could, you know, walk on the runway. He could be on fashion week, 
or what have you. And as I mentioned, I have seen pastors dressing like this. I've seen on social media, unfortunately, maybe not in an orange suit uh, or maybe not in a lime green suit, but, but they're wearing these skinny suits, these skinny pants that are hugging up their legs. And I've seen one person wearing stripes, bold black and white stripes, pinstripes. The spirit of prophecy says that ministers should be clothed in dark suits, but that's another, that's another topic altogether. What is our motive in dressing? Are we drawing attention to Christ or are we drawing attention to self? All right, examine yourself and ask the Lord, Lord, please free me from the, the, the bondage, the bondage of fashion. Free me from pride and love of dress. All right, so we are going to continue with our study. We will have other visuals uh, as we move forward. But I want to uh, go back to the screen here and read a few statements. All right, this says pride and love of dress. All right, and you guys can write down the, the references here. What is our condition in this fearful and solemn time? Alas, what pride is prevailing in the church? What hypocrisy, what deception, what love of dress? We must seek the Lord with true penitence. We must, with deep contrition of soul, confess our sins that they may be blotted out. Again, it says pride, the next statement from messages to young people. But this is a message to all of us because it's not just young people. We have people that seniors, we have people in all kinds of stages of life. And then other people, they dress their children, you know, like their dolls. They dress them up this way. Pride and extravagant in dress is a sin to which woman is especially prone. Now, it doesn't say solely or only women are especially prone. It says that they are especially prone. That doesn't exempt men. That doesn't exclude them. Men, especially today, they are just as consumed. And you guys can attest to this. You've seen it too. They're just as consumed in their dress as are women and spend just as long getting themselves ready. And, you know, it says God is constantly instructing his people to do what? Flee from pride of appearance. All right, I want you all to take these references down because we are gonna be moving kind of quickly through these, um, these quotations as there are so many. So take down the references. This one's from Ministry of Healing and we'll just highlight the, um, the bold part. So we should dress with natural simplicity. All right, actually I will read this one because this one is so beautiful. It says, in all respects, the dress should be healthful so there's a health component to our dressing, and we're going to get to that in future studies. It should have the grace, the beauty, the appropriateness of natural simplicity. I love that. Christ has warned us against the pride of life, but not against his grace and natural beauty. Now, do you remember we started off in Exodus chapter 28, and we read in verse 2 that the priests were dressed in holy garments, and they were dressed for glory and for beauty. That's repeated again in Exodus 28 verse 40 dress for glory and for beauty. God is a lover of the beautiful. You can look out in creation and you can see all of his beautiful handiwork. I love the springtime. I love the fall time. And we, we're in fall right now. We see the changing colors of the leaves. Very beautiful. The, the different hues, the yellows, the oranges, the reds. We see all of that. We see the different colors of the flowers. How beautiful they are. God is a lover of the beautiful. Just coming here, uh, to the studio this evening, we saw the beautiful sunset. Every, every morning and every evening, God paints a beautiful sunset. No two sunsets are alike. No two sunrises are alike. So God loves the beautiful. You can go to the ocean, even amidst this world of sin. And so it says that our dress should reflect, reflect natural beauty and simplicity. Everything in nature is in order. It's beautiful. It is um, neat right? It's beautiful, but it doesn't have the artificial. It doesn't have these uh, extra things, right? Okay, so now it says, Jesus pointed, I'm in the middle of the, of the quotation here. He, that's Jesus, pointed to the flowers of the field, to the lily unfolding in its purity. Thus, by the things of nature, Christ illustrates the beauty that heaven values, the modest grace, the simplicity, the purity, the appropriateness that would make our what? Our attire 
pleasing to him. Now we find those scriptures that she referenced, we find it in Matthew 6, 28. And most of us know this scripture where Christ points our attention to the lilies of the field. He said, consider the lilies, how they, uh, how beautiful they are. They toil, neither do they spin. And he said, Solomon in all of his glory can't even compare to that, right? So our dressing should be simple. It should be natural. It should be beautiful. So we have to avoid extremes as well, right? Okay, we're going to um, go to a few more. Let's define simplicity. We probably should have did this at the top. I want you to look at the second, the second definition. It says the quality or condition of being plain or natural. Now, we just saw that God loves the beautiful. So being plain and natural doesn't mean being devoid of color. Being plain and natural doesn't mean being drab or just being... Um, you know, just wearing black all the time. But it should be plain. It should be natural. And how should we dress? To the glory of God. God dress the priest for glory and for beauty. And I'm reiterating. I know I'm repeating myself, right? All right. So let's continue on. Let's look at this statement here. And you can reference this and write, write it as you go along. As we see our sisters departing from the simplicity in dress and cultivating a love for the fashions of the world, we feel troubled. By taking steps in this direction, they are separating themselves from God. So while we should be separating from the world, separating from Babylon, we find ourselves separating from God just to be in harmony with the world. This shouldn't be, friends. This shouldn't be. There are people in certain Sunday churches that are following dress reform more closely than even some people of God. There are some um, churches, the women don't wear pants. They don't wear things exposing their extremity. They, they don't wear short attire. They're men, they don't wear tight clothes, right? They don't wear the flamboyant clothes that we you know, demonstrated upon the mannequins a while ago. What about the people of God? We should be separate and distinct. We are a peculiar people. Our dress should testify to that fact. All right, let's go on. It says here that they are separating themselves from God and neglecting the inward adorning. What kind of adorning should we have? We should have a meek and quiet spirit. That's the only ornamentation we should have. Not these extra things, not these worldly fashions, right? It says here, how much better might it be? Their time now, they're spending unnecessary, they're spending their God-given time in the unnecessary ornamentation of their clothing. How much better might it be employed in the searching of the scriptures? But many people are searching the latest trends. Oh, they're researching, they're studying what, what's in, what's the in thing, you know, and they're spending time on that and they're neglecting their personal time. They're neglecting the inward graces that should be cultivated. They're neglecting the fruit of the spirit that they should have. And they are focusing on the external, focusing on worldly fashions to their own demise. Brothers and sisters, I hope we're not in this category. Okay, we want to continue on um, with the statement here. And it says, how much better might their time be employed in searching the scriptures, thus obtaining a thorough knowledge of the prophecies and of the practical lessons of Christ. Write this uh, reference down. Look at this um, statistic here. Nine-tenths of those who are devotees of fashion is living a lie. Deception, fraud is their daily practice. Examine ourselves, friends. Again, let's look at the bold part. Idolatry of dress again. It destroys all that is humble and meek and lovely in the character. Oh, may the Lord free us from pride of dress. May he free us from the thraldom, from the enslavement of fashion. May we break free and represent him aright. We do not discourage taste. Okay, here's the balancing statement here. We do not discourage taste and neatness in dress. Correct taste in dress is not to be despised or condemned while needless ruffles trimmings and ornaments should be left off. What does this next part say? We encourage our sisters to obtain good, durable material. Nothing is gained in trying to save means by purchasing cheap fabrics. We're gonna talk about that later on in our series. 
Let the clothing be plain. Let it be neat. And what's that last line? Let it be without extravagance of display. And I'm so very glad that the Lord is a God of balance. I, I, I am. We're going to read. We're going to reference these here. We're going to reference these statements on the screen one more time. All right. Healthful living. Write it down. We judge of a person's character by the style of dress worn. Then the next one from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, says that God would be pleased to see our sisters clad in neat, simple apparel and what? Earnestly engaged in the work of the Lord. Now, if we're dressed ex extravagantly, do you think we have any concern with the salvation of souls? No, we're more concerned in, you know, it seems like we're more concerned in the fashions of the world and being a part of the latest trends. And that, that should not be. All right. Let's look at these other principles as it relates to pride of dress. And then I'm going to deal with something that is very, very important and so that we don't fall on another extreme. So these are additional principles. Write the references down. I encourage you to pause the screen. These are principles as it relates to simplicity of dress. Okay, I'm not going to take the time to go through each one. It's on the screen. Again, pause it, take the references. And I encourage you also to read chapter 66 of Child Guidance. This is where these principles come from. The chapter is called Teaching the Fundamental Principles of Dress. So let me insert this point here. I'm going to give another visual example here. All right. So now while we are to avoid extravagance and gaudy display, a lot of us tend to want to swing on the other extreme. So now because I want to be free from the pride of dress, a lot of people don't take the time to be neat and appropriate and to dress for God's glory and to dress for beauty. This is an example of someone. Are they covered? Yes, they are. Is this what dress reform looks like? Put it in the chat. Put what you think. Is this a good representat representation of Jesus? If this person came, up, came to your door to witness to you about the Lord and to invite you to church and you see them dressed this way, even with the satin cap on the he their head, would, how would you respond to such a person? We are not to dress sloppy. We're not to make dress reform unattractive. The priests were dressed for what two things? For God's glory and for beauty. Everything about God is neat. God is a God of order. God is a God of neatness. Look in nature. Everything operates in order. Everything is beautiful. Like I said before, even amidst uh, the ravages that sin has brought upon the world, you can see, still see traces of God's beauty there. And so he has made us. He's fearfully and made us. So why should we just throw anything on and say that I can dress anyhow and God doesn't care? So we come out of the house with wrinkled clothes. It's not a sin to iron your clothes. When the Lord rose from the grave, right? What did he do with the napkin? He folded the napkin. God is a God of neatness, a God of order. This is disorderly. This person just looks like they rode out of bed, didn't even take a bath, wash their face, come out with the same cap that they sleep. And I know you've seen it. I know you've seen it at the airport. You've seen it at the grocery store. You have seen people coming out. Now, they probably don't have on the skirt or anything, but you've seen them with these caps on, right? It's, it's all over the place. So we just think, that because God wants us to flee from the pride of dress, we think that means we can dress anyhow. We can be wrinkled and maybe the clothes haven't even been washed or anything and we're not matching. This, this is not dress reform. And in fact, Sister White talks against us coming out looking like scarecrows. And believe me, it's not just women that do it. Men do it too. They look a hot mess as well. So we need to make sure that we are reflecting God in our dress. So we're not going to one extreme, putting on the fandangles and the, the bling bling and the, uh, the uh, jewelry, on our, the ornamentation and the excessive um, accessories, right? But neither should we go to this extreme where we just say, okay, as long as I'm covered, I can just put anything on and I can go and I, I'm representing God. And you know what? Just as flamboyant as that mannequin in the orange suit was and this, uh, the mannequin uh, when she had on the gold hat and the gold and all these beads and pearls, just as attention, just as that would draw attention to a person, 
This is not humility of dress. Why not? It draws attention as well. Even though that may not be your intention, it draws attention to you. It draws the wrong kind of attention because now people are looking at you like you don't have much respect for yourself. You don't have much respect for the Lord, you know, because you're just looking, looking well. You're not representing God. The God I serve is a God that is altogether lovely, right? He's the lily of the valley. He's natural. He's beautiful, right? It, not looking again like a scarecrow. So friends, please don't swing on the other extreme. Yes, there's beautiful colors and fl uh, flowers, but it doesn't mean you have to wear every single color on your person. That's not even matching. Remember, we started out that our dress should be characterized by appropriateness, neatness, and modesty. This is not neatness, okay? So please shun this extreme. And a lot of times, I, sorry, I hope I'm not rambling too much on this point, but a lot of times individuals that dress like this, this is a form of pride as well. So in your trying to com oh, um, overcompensate for not dressing with extravagance, you're displaying pride because you're saying, oh, look how humble I am. Look how humble I dress. And you take great pride in that. You take great pride that I don't dress like, you know, these people that put on these big fancy clothes and want to draw attention. You're drawing attention to yourself and you're comparing yourself to others saying how humble you're dressing. But it, it doesn't look good and it doesn't represent Christ. So we have a couple of points to go before we close out here. All right. I want to read another statement here. This says Puritan plainness and simplicity should mark the dwellings and apparel of all who believe the solemn truths for this time. All right. Again, this is a question I want us to ponder. We, we said that our title tonight was the peacock, look at me, peacock spirit versus the meek and quiet spirit. Many of us have this peacock spirit, right? And it says Christian youth. I would just say Christians. I have seen in some of you a love for dress and display, which has pained me. And some who have been well instructed, who have had religious privileges from their babyhood and who have put on Christ by baptism, thus professing to be dead to the world. I have seen a vanity in dress and a levity. You see what what accompanies this vanity of dress? A is a levity, a spirit of levity and conduct that have grieved the dear Savior and have been a reproach to the cause of God. I have marked with pain your religious declension. So when you see people displaying this idolatry of dress, this love of dress, you also see a spiritual degeneracy. It says, and your disposition to trim and ornament your apparel. So no, you may not be wearing it as jewelry, but you're putting the jewels on your clothes. Some have been so unfortunate as to come into possession of gold chains or pins or both and have shown bad taste in exhibiting them, making them conspicuous to attract attention. I can but associate these characters with what? With the vain peacock. So when you see people doing these things, they're dressing and behaving like the vain peacock. The vain peacock that displays his gorgeous feathers for admiration. It is all this poor bird has to attract attention for his voice and form are anything but attractive. Is your character attractive? People should be attracted to Christ because of you. But when we dress this way, it shows that there is a, a inward lacking. There's an inward degeneracy. We're trying to make up for the, the lacking of the inward graces in our hearts by putting things on and it doesn't work that way. We find ourselves just like the peacock, all right? Okay, so to illustrate the point that was just made about the scarecrow lady that we just had up, our closets, our, our closets do not have to look like this, okay? What do you notice about this closet? Put it in the chat, put it in the comments. What do you notice about this closet here? Do you notice, is it colorful? Does it look like the flowers of the field? No, you see black, you see brown, you see gray, you see dark colors. Am I saying there's anything wrong with wearing black and gray and brown and navy blue? Absolutely not. I love all of these colors. I, I love black. I love dark colors. But it's not a sin to wear colors. It's not a sin to, to 
wear the colors that God reflects in nature. Okay, your closet doesn't have to look like you have only funeral clothes. So again, I'm imploring you to avoid both extremes. We should be dressing for God's glory and for beauty. All right, so we are going to go ahead and close here. And I just want to say that time really goes by fast. When we're here, there's much more that can be said, but I do want to leave you with one last statement. Okay, what, two last points. <laughs> the first one is, if the world introduced a modest, convenient, and healthful mode of dress, which is in accordance with the Bible, it will not change our relation to God. You see, God is a God of balance, right? It will not change our relation to God, it says, or to the world to adopt such a style of dress. Christians should follow Christ and make their dress conform to God's word. They should shun extremes. I think we've showed that clearly tonight. We've illustrated it. We've said it in words. They should humbly pursue a straightforward course, irrespective of applause or of censure, and should cling to the right because of its own merits. So that is clear. And I would just give an example to make it clear. A lot of people in the world, there's new agers out here that are going on plant-based diets and they're singing the virtues of being on a plant-based diet. And to that we say, amen. Should we now, because we are plant-based eaters, say that, oh, I don't wanna be associated with the, the new agers or with these uh, atheists, so you know, I, I'm not gonna be a plant-based eater, no. So likewise, in like manner, it says if the world adopts a convenient style of dress that's in accordance with the Bible, it's not a sin to follow that. Like the maxi um, skirts, you see a lot of people that aren't of our faith that are wear wearing that. Does that mean it's a sin for us to wear it? No, we're following the Bible and we praise God that people in the world are starting to want to cover up and adopt certain uh, modest principles of dress reform. Just like we are very happy when people get on a plant-based diet because now their minds are clearer to receive the word when it comes to them. Last statement here, and this is a question, a solemn question that we each need to ask ourselves. It says, my sisters, and I'm gonna add my brothers, my sisters, your dress is telling either in favor of Christ and the sacred truth or in favor of the world. Which is it? I leave you with that, friends. And I do want to say, Please, please tune in next week. We have something special for you. I'm not going to give it away here, but we have a very, very special program on change of raiment. And so we hope to see you back same time, same place next Monday. Until then, may God keep us faithful and may God help us to adhere to these principles that he has so lovingly given us in his word of change of raiment, dress reform. Until next time, God bless.